Uh, yeah, talk to you a little bit about Electra. Those of you who have been following uh, may know us in our previous name. We were initially a cobalt exploration company uh, under the name of First Cobalt. Along the way, we acquired a refinery, and that quickly became core to our to our strategy, uh, as you'll see that next stage of the supply chain is uh, devoid of any activity beyond us here in the continent. And with the big push towards onshoring, it's, um, it's, it's evident there's a huge opportunity there for us. We were just in BMO yesterday, part of that conference, and for the first time, they had OEMs there. And I think we met with four or five different auto companies. Uh, we knew them already, but it's interesting to see them now coming to see us. A lot of them will be here next week. Uh, you'll have battery makers from Japan, Korea, and so increasingly, these mining gatherings are not mining gatherings. It's uh, supply chain gatherings as people try to figure out the supply chain. So it's, it's been a fun couple of years as we refocused our, our efforts on that next step of the supply chain, which is taking minerals that have been mined and processed and then converting them into a usable form for lithium-ion batteries. So yes, there'll be some forward-looking statements, no doubt, as I talk. And uh, yeah, I won't show too many sort of macro slides, but this one's important because this really speaks to Electra and our value proposition. When you look at these circles, there's cells in there, but let's maybe focus more on nickel, manganese, and cobalt. The, the blue portions there represents the proportion of uh, refining that's currently taking place in China. And for those of you who are following the Inflation Reduction Act and, and what that means to the auto supply chain, if U.S. automakers want to be qualified for that $7,500 vehicle credit for EV sales in America, you can't use critical minerals that were processed in China. And so we're all waiting for the rules. Um, the rules should be coming out in a matter of weeks in terms of what that means. Is there grandfathering? Is there a phase-in period or whatever? But it certainly has magnified the, the importance of, of the onshoring. I'm doing that quickly. And a few of the OEMs are a little bit more front-footed. We signed a, a three-year contract with LG Energy Solution in the fall for 60% of our production, of our first, first phase of our production. And, and I'd anticipate more transactions coming in the, uh, in the months ahead. But... Um, this is this is important, and it uh, as the rules become more pronounced again, sourcing the minerals and having the cell plants and assembly plants doesn't quite complete the uh, the circle. So we'll be a part of that, as you'll see. So for us, it started here. We acquired this asset uh, late 2017 as part of a roll up of some uh, silver and cobalt assets in northern Ontario, five hours north of here, two hours from Sudbury uh, to Miskaming Shores or New Liskert, as some of you may know it and what we called the cobalt camp back then. The, the assets, we've, we've got a royalty over the old land package, but we've uh, vented them off to Kuya Silver, and we kept this asset here. So 150 million of replacement value for what you see, green energy, ample water, indigenous and community support, a history of operation, and a refinery that historically produced cobalt and nickel in a carbonate form, not the sulfates that we need, as well as some silver dore. So a great launch pad, 600 acres, from, from which to grow. Too small for our plans, but it gives us kind of half of what we need. And so the step growth for Electra is to start phase one with cobalt refining, then go into recycling, and then we've been invited to build a second refinery in Quebec, north of Montreal, in the Bay Concord camp, and I'll, I'll come back to that. And then we still do have a, a, an important mineral exploration asset in the state of Idaho, so I'll come to that. But the destination here, if I were to look kind of five years out on this camp, what we're trying to achieve is to bring together a, a comprehensive set of chemical industrial park where you've got cobalt, nickel, manganese recycling, all of which feed into a precursor manufacturing. So that's when you take those materials and make that first step before it goes into the cathode. And by having everything co-located, you're saving on capex and opex because if they're apart, we take our cobalt, we put it into solution, we purify it, and then we've got to crystallize it for shipping only to have it redissolved at the PCAM. And so the push in Baconcourt and in Quebec, much like Europe and, and China, is to try to put those co-located in one spot. And I will say Canada has a huge advantage because permitting, you've got, you've got tails, you've got water, community support issue. It's not dissimilar to permitting a mine. And, and I'm sure many people in the room know what it's like to permit a mine in the U.S. It's not easy. It's a great place to operate, but can be challenging to, to permit. So I think Canada is going to do well in this particular space. And we've enjoyed some really good support uh, from, from the government. We've been invited on trade missions and to... China and Korea and state dinners and for a small little company punching above our weight we get uh, invited to a lot of tables and we're part of Canada's critical minerals growth strategy. Unfortunately my PDAC is going to be all government meetings this year which is maybe maybe good maybe bad but we'll we'll see. Nothing nothing against any government officials that may be in the room. Um, all right this is looking looking inside the refinery now the one that we acquired. Um, this is as it existed when we bought it as it exists today. 
Uh, this is important because I, I mentioned battery recycling, black mass, which I will come to. Just remember this image because while what you see here is going to tie into a much bigger footprint for cobalt sulfate, while we advance construction and complete that, we've got a ready-made plant to do a very large scale demonstration of a technology that we've been developing for over two years. And, uh, you know, spoiler alert, it's going very well. But when that's done and when we resume and complete construction of the cobalt plant, the, the strategy is to produce 5,000 tons of cobalt. So, you know, targeting EBITDA of about $2 a pound, so that's about 22 million U.S. of EBITDA during phase one. And then phase two, a couple of years later, expand that to 6,500 based on some of the equipment we're putting in there right now, which would get us up to a 30 million of annual EBITDA. On a, on a normalized uh, run rate. Feeds coming from the DRC, as it is for most of the world. So we've got there's Glencore, China Mali, ERG, four big mines that most of the auto world is buying from, so no different for us. Uh, instead of having that feed go from DRC to China and then back here, it goes from the DRC to us as the sole, the sole importer and processor. And then on the other side, as I already alluded to, we've got LG Energy Solution as our major client. A couple of MOUs as well that are in the works, so you might see more of that. And as the previous speaker alluded to, we are seeing uh, downstream investments in assets. And I think it's almost uh, almost expected now that future supply contracts are going to have some measure of, of a strategic investment. And so that's for, first and foremost in our minds as we look to, to future contracts. And the last bullet, yeah, $250 million of replacement value once we're done our project. So it, well in excess of our market cap, but we're in that construction period. So once we ramp up, we'd hope to realize some of that value on an EBITDA multiple basis. All right, so here's the asset again. All the land you see here, we, we, we pretty much own. So hydroelectric power uh, near Lake Temiskaming. So um, availability of resources, people. If you know New Liskard, you're, you're sandwiched between Roy Aranda, Timmins, Sudbury. So a great area for workforce. We've got rail access and lots of land upon which to grow. And with the construction, you can see where we are uh, as, of, as of December, as of today, really. Um, the main building that you saw on the pre previous slide is on the left. The steelworks that you see coming out of the back, that's the crystallizer circuit. And on the far right is solvent extraction. So the, the process, unlike Sudbury, this is not pyrometallurgy. We're in the world of hydrometallurgical processes. So no stacks, uh, no heat. This is all chemical based. So a clean, high extraction uh, process. And when you think of the steps, it's three steps, basically. You're bringing the material in, it's a leach process, and then it's solvent extraction to get the desired purity level, high purity level, and then you crystallize it. Bunch of stuff in between, but those are the three major steps in our, in our process. And you can see here, this is the 250 million kind of in process. Uh, we're, we're underway. And we, we got bit by the supply chain bug like everybody last year and supply and, and, and cost, so we're, we're a little bit over, but, uh, but we're on track uh, for, for producing later this year. Um, microchips is still a problem, freight's still a problem, but you know we're, we're, we're getting through it like everybody. And uh, the guys I think have done a better, and gals have done a better job than most, I think, in navigating it. And then you get the overview. I think I've walked you through most of it, but you know, one, one, of the, one of the advantages we have as we go from cobalt to recycling and so forth is just leveraging, you know, scaling up. Um, you know, one maintenance shop, one assay lab, one maintenance crew and superintendents and so forth. So the $250 million spend for a cobalt plant might be matched by a $50 million spend for a recycling plant. You know, the, the power's there and the roads and, and so forth. And so um, as we're able to spread that fixed cost over multiple product lines, uh, there'll, be, there'll be ever more efficiencies that'll, that'll come into play for us. All right, black mass. So black mass, just to, just to back up a step, black mass is what you get when you shred a battery. And so um, important distinction to be drawn between the first stage of battery recycling, which is where you collect the battery, remove the charge so it doesn't catch fire on you, remove the casing, and then you're crushing the cathode and the anode into a powder, this black powder that we call a black mass for obvious reasons. The, uh, the graphite renders it this color, but then it's got to go somewhere. And, and that where it goes today is mostly China or to Glencore's smelter in Sudbury. So 90% um, I believe of the batteries today that, that go through this process end up in Sudbury at a pyrometallurgical facility where the graphite, well, graphite's fuel, so you don't recover the graphite, you're not recovering the lithium, not sure you're getting much in the way of manganese, but you are getting your nickel, cobalt, and copper, and they pay based on the, the nickel and, and cobalt content. So hydrometallurgy, everything comes in the same way, comes in as black mass, and you put it in solution, and then you're going through various extraction steps, and you're targeting everything. Um, it was once thought that manganese wasn't worth recovering. Well, no, think again, we're, we're getting there as well. And so we started this process with a view, again, two and a half years of testing. We have Hatch on our process. We've got SGS 
We've done dozens of lab and bench scale tests. Now we're doing it on a scale of a ton a day in that plant that you saw, and a lot of benefits to do it in a large scale live environment like that, a lot of learnings to be had. And we started this just after Christmas, really. We started to, started to recommission all the old circuits. Uh, the team's done a, done a really good job. And you know, where we are right now, it's the you know, couple of firsts, the first to do it at this scale. As I said, there's a lot of lab-based uh, events going on around the country. But uh, on this scale, we're the only ones, and we're the first to do an MHP product as well. And so proud of the team and what we've accomplished. I will say that the, the grade of that MHP, we do favor higher cobalt uh, materials coming in, but we're getting grades that are close to 40%, and the market standard is kind of 35. The impurity levels are within, well within the spec of the sales contract that we've got in place. So knock on wood, we'll have our first, I guess our first product shipment and revenue here soon, once we fill up a container. Um, but that's going really well. And then we've got other streams, the manganese, we've got a copper product that are not pure, but they're saleable. Uh, the lithium circuit um, is a small one because we never had lithium recovery in this plant. So bear with us as we, uh, as we account for, for what that looks like. Um, but we're, yeah, we're getting everything the graphite as well, a very high quality graphite product. So uh, we'll have more news on, on sales contracts and whatnot. The main targeted elements right now are the nickel and the cobalt. And uh, we're getting product, I think, every other day starting to accumulate. So um, it's not so much how much money is it going to make. Is, is this a technical success? And if it is a technical success, what does it mean for Electra in the race to, uh, to, to, to install its capacity upstream and downstream? And so the business model for us is not to big, build a big refinery to, to process every battery in sight. It really is to perfect the process and partner with our downstream partners. And I think the, the future of battery recycling, it's not the shredding. The shredder can be built right next to a cell plant, and there's a dozen of them going up in the U.S. today. But you build your shredder next to that cell plant, a lot of the product that's going to be coming to market in 2025 is going to be battery scrap. Up to 10% of the material going through a cell plant could find its way in recycling. And so you don't need to be big, you just need to be good. And if you can create that closed virtuous loop, then a hydromet plant loves consistency. So if we're taking 811 scraps from an LG or, or a Stellantis or whomever uh, day in, day out, um, you get to steady state and it's a nice, it's a margin opportunity. And that's, I guess, one other difference with mining is we're not trying to play the commodity. We're trying to earn a consistent margin, whether it be cobalt, nickel, recycling, we let other people take commodity risk, we earn the margin here in North America, we partner, and it becomes a nice, hopefully, dividend-paying company once we get through all our CapEx. Uh, Bay Concourse, I mentioned uh, this as well, sort of the next leg of growth. Uh, in addition to Ontario, this big park is well at hand. Uh, GM and POSCO, as well as BASF, have committed um, about $400 million or so of investments. Uh, we're expecting to see Ford and EcoPro formalize an announcement here as well. So what this means is you will have three, call it captive, three adjacent cathode active material manufacturing facilities looking for material. Valet has announced that they're going to build a nickel dissolution plant here to produce the nickel sulfate. And on that same plot of land, Electra is working with the government to carve out our own space. We've got to do a, a, an engineering study, uh, but we've got an indicative letter of interest. They want to see a Canadian company uh, build this plant rather than a foreigner, which is why we were approached. And the funding opportunity under the Strategic Innovation Fund of Canada, as well as Investment Quebec's own mandate, is to see anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of the capex covered uh, through the public purse through various mechanisms that they have. Unlikely to be 50, but heck, even 35 percent capex makes for a, a very attractive entry point. And so the discussions we're having here with one of the three parties would be a you know a 10-year contract with an investment to accelerate our production or our development here, so that we could build a plant, have it commissioned for 2026. So stay tuned. It'll, it'll take a little while to negotiate these, but. Um, we're pretty pretty encouraged by the, the welcome mat that's been rolled out and some of the strategic interests that we're seeing um, from the downstream. And then the last asset, um, maybe a redheaded stepchild. Now we're into mining again. So we've gone from chemical back upstream. Um, love this asset, Idaho Cobalt Belt, one of the few places outside the DRC where you'll get primary cobalt and high-grade cobalt. Uh, Gervois is ramping up their ICP or ICO asset uh, adjacent to former producing Blackbird Mine which is a uh, Glencore site, and we're to the south at Iron Creek. But that whole belt is recognized by the U.S. Geological Survey as the most prospective place in America to find cobalt, and I would say on the continent. Um, think of it as high-grade underground deposits where you'll have equal revenue today, probably fairly well balanced between the copper and the cobalt. And so for us, um, we haven't moved it forward very much because all of our, you know, our best use of, sort of capital, obviously, is to get to cash flow. But, but um, we'll have to figure out a strategy. We do it with a partner. Uh, it's got option value. Maybe we develop it. Maybe we spin it out. But that asset's got a good future. We just got to figure out where it sits. 
given our limited time and resources. So um, I'm going to pause there. I think that covers it really well. The one thing I didn't touch perhaps was our, uh, our, our carbon footprint. So our carbon footprint on our cobalt plant based on a life cycle assessment is going to be half of that of our largest peer. And so ESG is something I think we'll do very well at, given that we're in Canada, renewable energy, and it's something we can continue to do better at. We have our first sustainability report that came out in January. We're, we're looking at doing a sustainability rating later this year so that we can keep lowering that bar on our achievements. And that obviously matters to the supply chain that we're a part of, as well as the consumers that are looking for true zero emission vehicles. So thank you for your time.